Okay, thank you. Uh, so I'm an associate professor at Ming Tech at Sondi Matario. Uh, and I will present here work performed by uh, our PhD student, Ari Pommier, who has defended last year, that's why he isn't here. He works now, for real. So, um, and this work, uh, and this work were involved other people you may know. And it has been a uh, cooperation with Arriva, and some of the results I will show here have just appeared in Akdamat. So what is the industrial problem we are looking at? It's uh, reheat cracking, also called stress relaxation cracking or stress relief cracking. Uh, this is uh, found in these kind of steel, stainless steels during a service of power plants, typically in the heat affected zone of a weld. So you're close to a welded joint here, and in service you see such kind of cracks. Okay, so that's an industrial problem. Um, there are several alloys here, stainless steels, 316, uh, that are employed, and uh, for this one, stress uh, uh, re cracking has been reported, whilst for those two uh, with lower carbon content, uh, this has not been reported. So there is a difference in composition here uh, for these two alloys, lower carbon and more nitrogen. So there's a lack of knowledge uh, about the thermomechanical conditions for reheat cracking in 316L and LM steels. So what are the driving forces of uh, reheat cracking? So what has been identified in the literature is the presence of high tensile residual stresses. So you do a weld, and while uh, the material cools down, you will develop tensile stresses, and also prior plastic deformation. So these seem to be two uh, necessary conditions to uh, produce reheat cracking. And then you have grain boundary degradation at high temperatures while you use your weld. So this is kind of a schematic drawing that shows you the driving forces we think of. So these are the residual stresses, the prior plastic deformation, formation of carbides, diffusion of solute atoms along the grain boundary, secondary phases, and uh, pro probably a segregation of phosphor on the grain boundary. So um, segregation of carbides on the grain boundary and phosphor segregation has been identified to be a problem here. And uh, something else one needs to know is that high nitrogen content leads to uh, a decrease uh, of stress relaxation rate when you use your alloy. So you will stay longer time at high stresses. Okay? So uh, the objectives here are to gain a better understanding of the roles of alloying uh, of these uh, elements, carbon, nitrogen, and phosphor, on the thermomechanical reheat conditions, and to develop a constitutive modeling framework to simulate and predict this damage. Here is the kind of approach and outline of the talk. We will uh, talk about the mechanical experiment. So here we use a CT-like a specimen that we compress first and that then has uh, tensile residual stresses here and we do this for different materials uh, we look uh, then put this into an oven and uh, after that look uh, do some microstructural analysis of the damage we also constitute a model uh, I will just show you the simulations but not the model here uh, and then we want to perform some simulations that can help us to understand the damage development. So some words on composition. So we will look here at five different alloys because we need different compositions. Here we show carbon, nitrogen, phosphor. These are industrial grades with low, medium, and high uh, content of these uh, alloying elements. Um, this one here has medium carbon and high nitrogen. Uh, which means that we are long time at high stresses and we have carbon that can nucleate carbides on the grain boundaries. So this is a candidate for reheat cracking. And then we wanted to study the effect of phosphor. Do you say phosphorus or phosphor? 
phosphorus on uh, grain boundary cracking. And uh, so we have one alloy with uh, low phosphor, very low phosphorus, and one with high phosphorus. And we have low carbon, but high nitrogen to keep high residual stresses during a long time during aging. Um, other than that, the microstructure in terms of grain size of these five materials was very similar. Uh, we have no crystallographic texture. These are obviously austenitic grains. We have some uh, manganese sul uh, sulfides inside the grains and no ferrite. And all this was similar for the three, for the five materials. So, how did we try to reproduce uh, the conditions for reheat cracking? We were inspired by work by Tus uh, Tursky. So we had uh, first rolled the material, so we do cold rolling to in introduce some strain. So 20% cold rolling we did in the lab, and you end up with deformation twins you can see here in the EBSD. Then we take this steel that has been rolled and cut out a specimen that looks like this. So this has a notch root, it's not a classical CT specimen. And we go and compress here to a 25 kilonewton and unload and then we end up with a residual stress field that looks like this. So when we put this into an oven, in a way we have a tensile machine in the oven without a machine because we have residual stresses that can then relax while you uh, have the sample in the oven for uh, some time. So when you take the sample out of the oven uh, and you cut, here is the former notch root radius. Uh, and in this optical micrograph, you can set, see the height of the grains. And on some grains, you find um, carbides and voids. This is the second steel for a notch root radius of one millimeter and this aging time and temperature. So we have two grains and along the grain boundary we see voids, typical creep voids. For another condition, a notch root radius of 0 0.5 millimeter, we actually really see a crack. So there must be some influence of the severity of the notch on uh, the development of the phenomena. So, um, what is at the origin of this? Um, or how can we interpret this? Uh, well, carbide nucleation is certainly a, a problem here, and this is the time temperature uh, precipitation diagram. And actually, so this is done by these guys, Weiss and Stickler. And when you perform uh, some cold work that what we did through uh, laminating the material, you shift this curve. So you do your, this is more prone to carbide segregation. And our material is here. And indeed, we can see carbides along the grain boundary. This is an SEM where we tilted the surface. So here you can nicely see the relief of the particles. If you stick this, you cut out a a TEM foil and look at the TEM, you can see uh, nano cavities here and also some carbides. So these have been identified as carbides uh, through EDS. So we have a classical mechanism of uh, carbide nucleation and then the deco uh, decohesion uh, mechanism. Then we wanted to look at uh, the phosphor. Uh, the influence of phosphor, and this is the isolines of uh, the monolayer coverage uh, according to this model. So we would have thought that we should find a lot of phosphor on the grain boundaries, but actually uh, we didn't. So there was no damage in the high phosphor alloys, the two alloys we have cast, one of them was high phosphor, nor on the low pho phosphor steels. However, when we did uh, some pre-aging prior to the compression, we could indeed find some cavities here. But this is, um, the, so the high phosphor content is not as detrimental as what we expected. 
And there may be an explanation for this that is a site completing segregation mechanisms between phosphor, nitrogen, carbon, or other things. Okay, so now we have looked at uh, composition. Here we look at grains and grain boundaries, so the misorientation between different grains. So this is performed here for the five materials and uh, the number of grains here, the total is 100%. And we can see that for all of these alloys we have a lot of sigma-3 grain boundaries, more than 50%. And now there are some grains that show damage. And if we look at the distribution of this damage, so in total this is 100% of the damaged grain boundaries, only very few show uh, damage on sigma-3 gram boundaries, so actually what we see is that these are not prone to damage, whereas the gram boundaries with high um, misorientation, but that are not sigma-3, show damage. So this is consistent with the literature. We have uh, random gram boundaries that show creep cap uh, cavitation, whereas those don't. And the explanation for this would be that the sigma-3 gram boundaries are actually too perfect to nucleate uh, carbides on these sigma-3 gram boundaries. So this is just the matrix of all the tests we have performed and the red ones show damage, don't care about this. A summary here is uh, on the contents and uh, how the materials are resistant to reheat cracking is uh, that this is the less resistant and actually the reason for this is that here we can nucleate carbides and we are during a long time at high stress levels. Um, so if we should give a recommendation to make materials uh, is that the high carbon content is detrimental to uh, reheat cracking resistance and you should put a lot of nitrogen only if the carbon content is low because this one has similar nitrogen but uh, a lot lower uh, carbon and doesn't show reheat cracking. Okay, now we wanted to quantify a bit more of the damage uh, in the specimen and for that we wanted to use a three-dimensional technique which is uh, synchrotron tromography However, in tomography, uh, the resolution you have is micrometer. And the voids you've seen there at the nano scale are very, very small. So our idea was to cut a sample, pull on the sample for, for quite some strain, and open up the defects so that we can see them in 3D. We did this at the ESRF and uh, looked close to the former notch tip. So this is a typical result you get. Here was the former uh, notch tip uh, during uh, the compression. Uh, you can see the damage here. These are uh, shown here in 3D in red. And uh, Harry has uh, proposed a damage parameter to, in a way, uh, have a lot of statistics, but show a damage variable that is then just a scalar along the distance from the notch. And so he looks at the projection of these cracks, intergranular cracks, uh, on the surface. And then he, he discretizes the, the volume and calculates this damage variable. So if you do this for different uh, notch root radii, so the former uh, notch of the CT specimen was here. And here you see three different results with the damage variable here and different notch root radii. This was 2 mm, 1 mm, 0 0.5. So the severity is going up. And indeed, the damage we can see through this damage variable is increased with the lower notch root radius. So this is the effect of mechanics. Now we did the same for uh, the IB steel here, all this is the IB steel that shows most of the damage uh, for different temperatures at which this was hold, held. And actually we see that 
The most detrimental temperature is the one between 550 and 600. It's 575. So actually there's a, a maximum here. Okay. Okay, now we come to some results from uh, the simulation. So I will don't don't I won't talk about the plasticity model, but just say it involves kinematic hardening. Two minutes. Two minutes. And uh, so from the model, you get here uh, the result in terms of uh, strain and uh, stress, and then. Uh, this is uh, so increase in, with with a notch root radius that increases uh, the stress goes down. This is the stress level you get uh, when you compress, and then when you put this into the oven, the stress level goes down. Now you can compare uh, if this is the notch root radius. Compare uh, the triaxiality, stress triaxiality, which is this one here, or the maximum prim principal stress and the damage distribution, this actually seems more governed by the principal uh, stress, sigma 1. And there seems also be to, uh, to be a critical stress to nuclear damage, which is around 740 megapascals if you superimpose the stress field and the damage field. And if we now try to, in post-processing, use some uh, model to predict the damage, we can use this one here that is based on the principal uh, stress and uh, just with two fitting parameters, we can see that uh, for the different notch root radius, this is the experimental data, we managed to fit uh, these curves pretty well. And now I come to conclusions. Uh, for the first time, intergranular damage has been found in 360. 316L type steels. Uh, we need high carbon content uh, to nucleate these voids, which is a bad thing, obviously, for um, usage of this material. And high nitrogen should only be added if carbon is low. The effect of phosphor was less than expected. The most detrimental temperature was between 550 and 600 degrees. Sigma 1 was uh, identified as a uh, threshold, to have a threshold to nucleate this. And we propose to use uh, in post-processing a uh, relationship based on Sigma 1 to predict uh, the damage development. That's the end. Thank you very much.